and we're going to vote on who had the best complication, and these are some good complications. So, so uh, let me introduce uh, Toby Rockefeller first. Thank you. I don't know if I should be excited about giving these I blew it or I screwed up cases, but I do appreciate the opportunity. So this one I labeled quit before you start, because in hindsight, that's kind of how I felt. And maybe I should have quit before I started. So my patient was a 45-year-old female. Uh, she had severe idiopathic pulmonary um, arterial hypertension. She had um, been followed by our pulmonology team, and she had new ascites on her most recent visit with a BNP greater than 1,200. She had some cardiorenal syndrome. Her sodiums had always been running a little bit low, and she was on chronic diuretic uh, therapy. Her creatinine had stepped up to 1.3 on the most recent check. She was on a pretty intense medical regimen of epoprostenol, tadalafil, and ambrosentin, digoxin, and bumex. Um, and she had... She had gotten progressively worse on her six-minute walk test. She only got 365 meters. Her heart rate did come up, and her SATs stayed around in the low 90s. Um, at home, she was in the low 90s and upper 80s, and she was on oxygen uh, most of the time. Her blood pressure didn't really change with the walk test. Her pulmonary function tests were also abnormal. She had an abnormal FEV1, which was 50% predicted. She had a bubble study that was negative for right-to-left shunting. She had considered lung transplant and originally said no, but as she became more and more debilitated, she started to reconsider lung transplantation. So she was referred by the pulmonologist to us for an atrial septostomy, an atrial stent, with the hopes of decompressing her right heart um, due to the significant RV diastolic dysfunction at the expense of making her bluer. So I don't know how well you can see that, but here's her chest x-ray, and you can see her indwelling central line that she has. She was very cachectic, and she had pretty significant ascites. She was really, really dyspneic um, at night, so she couldn't lay flat at all. And when I met her, she was kind of upright and uh, on oxygen, satting in the upper 80s. And this was her echo. So you can see how dilated that right <laughs> ventricle is and how the septum is flattened. This is the apical picture here. You can see how significant this tricuspid regurgitation is, the significant right atrial dilation. And you see the left atrium is really just a crescent that surrounds the right atrium. So already I'm getting a little bit more nervous about doing a transeptal puncture. Her atrial septum is also kind of thick, I thought. So then before the case even started, I was wondering, could I ever do this with anesthesia? The answer was no. Um, would I do this with transthoracic echo, or do I put her under anesthesia and do TEE? I would love to do ice, but we, our ice system broke. So we had no, we had no ice in anywhere. Um, then the question was, should I use a Brocken brow, just use a needle, or should I try RF? And then she also was on chronic warfarin use, um, and her INR was greater than three at baseline. So I was like, how long should I hold her warfarin? Should I hold the warfarin? Um, and then should I stint the atrial septum? And if so, how big should I make it? She's already satting in the 80s, so do I really want a big hole in the atrial septum? Am I going to put her into the 60s? Like, I didn't really know what to expect here. So I asked my uh, senior mentor to help me, because this is definitely not a case to do. I was only one month into my uh, facultyhood. So here's uh, some of the cath data. She was fully awake, not sedated really at all. She was totally conversant and she was um, reclined, almost sitting up. We used local to get access and we decided we would do most of it with just fluoro and if we needed to look with echo, we could do transthoracic uh, echo. So her baseline uh, cardiac index was low. Her SVR is normal-ish. Her heart rate, her hemoglobin and her ACT. We got an ACT right at the beginning and it was 184. So we didn't really heparinize once we got access. But you can see the pressures here. So the, the right atrial pressure, the mean atrial pressure is around 30 and the RV EDP is 36. So we got up into the SVC, put the seven French Mullins sheath and dilator up into the SVC. The wire was in the, the dilator, but I never really advanced the, the needle. 
we pulled down from the SVC into the right atrium and kind of advanced, you know, over the limbus. And I thought I was in a good spot to just puff some contrast. And the first puff of contrast was into this pericardial space. So we pulled down, put the wire back in the SVC, and came down a little bit lower. And this time, obviously, you can see the echo probe down here. It was on the, the first one also. We were looking and we, were, we thought we were a little lower and we did get a good stain of the septum, so went forward with the needle. But then this picture to try to confirm that we were in the left atrium was again in the pericardial space. And you may be able to see, is the laser on here? You can see this kind of effusion here. So then we made a third attempt. So, so we modified the, the bend. So we put another bend further down on the, the needle. And we came across into the left atrium. And here's a, a, pic a confirmatory picture that was actually reassuring. You can see the pulmonary veins light up. And so the, the rosen wire we exchanged for a nine, flex, um, nine French flex sheath, got into the left atrium, and gave her some heparin. And again, you see this growing pericardial effusion. So then we, we got a 2910 stent on a 12 bib, uh, half uncovered, flared the LA in, pulled it into the septum, uh, uncovered the rest of the stent, flared the right atrial side. And this is a picture into the right atrium through the sheath, and you can see good right to left shunting here. And her saturations, now she's on a, a face mask, non rebreather, like 15 liters, and she's satting in the low 70s. Um, and the whole time she's fully awake, so it's hard to see this effusion and you're kind of mumbling to each other like, that's going to be a problem, right? Um, but she's like awake and she's like, what's going on, guys? Everything's fine? Like, so, yeah, so here, then this is the echo, um, and we realize this is becoming a problem because now she's becoming hypotensive. So her INR is 2.2, her PTT is greater than 150. We put in a pericardial drain. And I got 600 mLs of just frank blood. So we auto-transfused that, but then we gave her protamine and FFP and platelets and factor seven. She's still awake? Wide awake, just talking. For the, we just did local, and she, she winced a little bit, but she was a very tough lady. How? Can Sorry? How did she wince? Just like that, that was it. <laughs> Anesthesia was in the room, yes. Yeah. So at this point, she's hypotensive after the wince, and she's getting phenylephrine boluses from anesthesia while she's awake. And so now I'm trying to like explain to her what's going on. We're starting a norepi drip at 0.05, still getting frank blood out of this pericardial drain. But now after correcting her coagulopathy, we decided not to continue auto-transfusing. So we activated our massive transfusion protocol, and she's getting all this blood. So then I went and updated her fiance, called pulmonology, called the adult and peds CT surgery. The adult surgeon that was on didn't have privileges to operate at Children's. Our peds CT surgeon was willing to go to the OR, but she was very reluctant to go to the OR, and in her advanced directives had said she'd never, under any circumstance, wanted to be on ECMO. So we discussed with the, uh, the patient while we transfused four units of PRBCs and got another 1,300 mLs of frank blood um, and eventually decided to go to the OR after talking to her. I forget how many hours we were in the lab like, managing this. It probably wasn't four hours, but it felt like it. Um, and then the patient and, the and her fiancé got to talk in the hallway about what was going on, and she said, we have to go to the OR, we have to get this fixed. I, but I don't want to be on ECMO. Um, so I went, went to the OR, had the pericardial drain on the way to the OR, I realized wasn't draining anymore. And I was like, it is, has it sealed up? Or are we actually, do we need to go to the OR? And the whole time on the way to the OR, she's wide awake, she's sitting up in her bed, she's huffing and puffing, satting in the 60s, um, but still a little hypotensive. And then she arrested in the OR while sitting on the table. So then she had an emergent sternotomy. She had a tense pericardium. When they opened it, it just kind of everywhere. Um, and the surgeons noted a laceration in the roof of the right atrium between the SVC and the aorta that was around two centimeters long. 
and then a puncture in the roof of the left atrium, which I think was from the second pass when we actually did come across. We just, that left atrium is so compressed, we just went across the septum and then out the atrium. Um, and that was a, just like a puncture that was half a centimeter. So then she was unable to separate from bypass, ECMO cannulation in the CI. Uh, then she had renal failure, a family meeting, and then they withdrew support the next day. A lot of, a lot of family tension, but ultimately she ended up dying, I think, the next, yeah, the next day after the procedure. So obviously our risk management team was involved. And, 40, 45, 46. So she was evaluated for lung transplant. She had originally declined that option, but then she was in the process of reconsidering it as she became more debilitated. And she was, this was supposed to be a bridge to lung transplant or a bridge to decision, really. Yeah. So if we're gonna like the next time this is in your on your holding area waiting to roll in, and you've got a set of details in front of you, like what are you gonna like what would you do differently? It's a, you know what, all of us have bad cases and we have deaths and we have miserable complications, sometimes that are completely avoidable. It is part of part of our work. But I mean like it's learning seeing this and knowing that it can happen and kind of have a feel for what's going to happen is very powerful yeah. in, you know, go ahead. Well, uh, that's pro part of the reason why I called it the quit before you start, because I do wonder how much benefit this would have been for her, and it was an extremely high risk. Um, so that's the, in hindsight, I wouldn't have done the case, and certainly if I'm going to do the case, I would have, I would have had ice for sure. I, I think doing this trans thoracic echo, I just didn't see well enough to do the case safely. <clears throat> Again, hindsight is always you know, 2020. The indication for the septostomy, knowing that her baseline oxygen set was 80, 81 percent, right? So yeah, it, the, a lot of the notes and reports said it was in the 90s, um, but then every time we assessed her, it was in the upper 80s, and she was on oxygen already. So I didn't know how how blue am I going to make her? How much better is she going to feel? Is the right heart really going to recover? I don't know. I think that all of you said in what you're trying to do is that's correct. This kind of patient at our point in Santa Columbia, we would not do a septostomy. We don't typically can. We wouldn't be going for septostomy now since these kinds of patients would be thoracic surgeon and a cardiac surgeon and they're doing COTS um, as a potential. You would do percutaneous COTS? No, not, we, we've not done the percutaneous. They've been doing it surgically. We had talked about a POTS for her, but because her RV pressure was like 20, 30 points subsystemic, and this was primarily RV diastolic dysfunction, we thought that this would be more, if anything was going to help her, it would have been this, and a POTS could have potentially made things worse with PA pressures that were subsystemic. Oh, the first one. Yeah. Second, Yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we 
gray on us. You can put it in the OD. Uh, you can put it in the In the area. Yeah. But that's just the indication. I don't think this would be indicated. Because when you have these patients who are desaturated already, doing anything other than that, unless you have that point of the respiratory And you have to have a bladder definition of this is going to be a transplant, this is going to be excess or not. How about when you speak louder? I, I don't think this is indicated as far as this. This was a dying procedure. Somewhat the procedure itself, if you had to do it, first of all, if you had to do it, you should have done it with echo, right? And we know <laughs> that, right? Especially when you have a collapsed left atrium with the needle will, the small transfer needle will go either the, left, either the roof or left atrium or posteriorly. Second is if you did it by fluoro only, then what you should have done is to have another landmark. So you, one of the things that you could have put is a pigtail catheter. If you put a pigtail catheter in the aortic valve, then at least you would know the height. <coughs> Right, and so then you could be post both posterior as well as below. You could have got that. That's but the right atrium yeah. puncture is difficult. The first, first no, guys, right. we also have three other cases to protect. Okay. So I want to. I, I think what we're going to do is we're going to lock it down. I think first of all, it's a great case. It's a great learning case. Uh, I agree. I definitely would have done this with ice, and I would have canceled. If I didn't have ice available, then cancel it. This guy's going to cancel. cancel. Yeah. Second of all, did you, you said you stented the septum. Is that right? Correct. Our approach is a little bit, and I, I agree, the starting low sats is concerning, but you know, everything in retrospect, but we're very cautious with a septostomy, and we actually do it staged. So I will use an eight millimeter balloon first, get a sat of 88, goodbye. See how you do, see if there's a change, and then bring them back and do some more, more dimensions later. And just for the audience to know, on compassionate basis, you can get this device called AFR, atrial flow regulator. It's an ASD device with a hole. It comes in different sizes from Oculotech. So you can get it on compassionate. In this case, of course, slam dunk compassionate case. Better than a stint, because a stint, if you, even if you're really good, they may embolize. Unless if you have the dog bone stent available, otherwise placement of a stent in the atrial septum is technically challenging. Great. Okay, thank you. Very good. I do think the advice of the bend further down is is really useful. Obviously, it worked the third try. Okay, so I appreciate you guys letting me present this case. Um, it's called Why You Don't Look the Gift Horse in the Mouth because this was a different interventionist from an outside institution. I don't have any disclosures. So this was a four-year-old, 17 kilo, history of detransposition, a large VSD pulmonary stenosis who initially underwent a Nikaido procedure uh, back in March of uh, 2012, had an epicardial pacemaker, and then had had most recently an RV to PA conduit utilizing a 19 millimeter homograph back in June of 2015. This case was in October of 2016, just for reference. Uh, he had had a stenosis of the homograph um, and had had a uh, 26 millimeter EV3 max LD placed. He also had a history of left pulmonary artery stenosis and had had a um, genesis stent placed back in August of 2015. <coughs> he also had a history of fungal endocarditis in 2015 that required his most recent conduit uh, replacement. So he presented to an outside hospital with a couple of day history of URI symptoms, some subjective fever, and then started having some vomiting, came in with dehydration and was found to be coronavirus positive. Um, <clears throat> he had an echocardiogram uh, that was performed um, at the outside hospital and then at ours uh, that showed severe recurrent RV to PA conduit obstructions and severe RV dysfunction. Uh, his lactate was 10. He was intubated at the outside hospital, started on melanone, dopamine, and epinephrine. So he presented to our hospital around midnight, and then um, we were notified about this patient the next morning in ICU rounds. Uh, his primary cardiologist slash interventionalist had, pr have had privileges at our hospital. Um, when we asked him if he wanted to uh, have this case, he said, no, 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 you guys can do it. <laughs> um, so this is just his baseline echocardiogram. Um, he has severe RV dysfunction. Um, obviously his 
RV pressure was quite high with a, a peak gradient of 75 plus right atrial pressure. Um, his systolic blood pressure at that time was 96. <coughs> LV function was reasonable on all of his inotropes, um, but again, RV dysfunction and dilation. Um, this is a look at his RV to PA conduit. It looked like there was some thrombus or some sort of obstruction uh, within the previously placed stent. Uh, he had a peak gradient of 78 and a mean of 53. <clears throat> so in lieu of time, we'll save thoughts for the end. Um, but we took him to the lab. Uh, his baseline uh, mixed venous saturation was 39. His right age feral pressure was 27 with an RV pressure of 69 with an end diastolic pressure of 28. And his systolic pressure at that time was 64. His cardiac index uh, was 2.3, and he was on 50% uh, FiO2 at that time, and his ABG was 7294680. So um, at that point, uh, baseline angiogram shows severe RV dysfunction, dilatation, and then I don't, how do you use this point? Is it the green thing? Yeah. Okay. So it looks like there's some obstruction and clot material kind of within the stent. <coughs> Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so, um, so, so sorry, does it matter? <coughs> in this situation, does it matter? Well, I think it would. You can go straight to the OR and take the whole thing out. So, so we had actually had the discussion with the surgeons. Um, we um, had a discussion previously before we took the kid to the lab. They said they absolutely were not taking this patient to the operating room. Um, and uh, we called them as soon as I put the catheter in the right atrium and saw that the right atrial pressure was 27. Uh, we called them into the room and said, okay, this kid's very, very sick. Um, do you want us to go on ECMO preemptively? What do you, you know? And we had that discussion. And they said, you have our full support. Just keep going. So that's what we did. Um, so we uh, initially balloon angioplasty the stent. Um, with a 14-millimeter uh, Armada balloon. The stent, we didn't have the previous cath report because this was done at a different institution. The, the stent placement was done at a different institution, but it measured just there were 16, so we figured it was probably implanted on about an 18. <laughs> um, so this is um, our uh, angiogram post-angioplasty, and as you can see, um, we now have a uh, clot that's kind of bouncing around the proximal right pulmonary artery. Um, of note, which I probably should have pointed out before, the left lower pulmonary artery was out from the get-go. <laughs> so um, he had a fairly massive pulmonary embolus in the left lower pulmonary artery from the beginning. Um, that's known in the past, or this is this presentation? This presentation, the, this presentation yeah. <laughs> so um, we decided at that point we would just go ahead and stent and uh, kind of smush the clot that was there. I mean, this is this patient was this was we were considering this a salvage procedure and figured the patient was going to die if we didn't do anything. Um, so we stented um, a palmos stent on an 18 bib balloon. Uh, the RV gram I didn't put in here because it just showed that the stent was actually patent, but I wanted you to see kind of what the branch pulmonary arteries looked like. <coughs> so this is a look in the right pulmonary artery. Um, <coughs> and in the left, which you can see now the clot has kind of bounced into the proximal left pulmonary artery, and um, the left lower pulmonary artery is still occluded. Um, what you can also note in this angiogram is we are now bradycardic. And um, we, uh, they fully supported us. And at this time, they were really fully supporting us because we were um, <laughs> demanding that they put the patient on ECMO. So uh, he became hypotensive uh, while they were getting ECMO um, initiated. And we had already had ECMO outside the room from the start. So it was kind of prepped and ready to go. Um, he was, became acidotic, hypoxic, uh, and then required CPR. Got a total of 16 minutes of CPR while we were cannulating onto ECMO, and, oh, sorry, uh, can you, so, uh, can you click on the title? No, sorry. Go, uh, go back to the last, uh, sorry. Um, 
I can't click the way I want to with this, but. What do you want to do, Chuck? So, um, so on this, if you click on the title, it should pop up an angiogram, sure. like on the title, title, yeah. Up, there, click there, yes. So this is what our stent looked like after CPR. Um, the fortunate part of it is that um, we still had a catheter across it, so um, that was fortunate for us because we already had access across it. So um, re-dilating uh, the RVDP a condiment stent was actually quite easy. <coughs> um, so post redilation and on ECMO, uh, the right pulmonary artery really looked okay. Um, the left pulmonary artery, not so much. <coughs> so um, at this point in time, uh, we decided that we would turn our attention to the left pulmonary artery and see what we could do to um, open it back up. So we ended up recannulating the left lower pulmonary artery uh, using a Cook CTO wire. Um, this was a multiple, multiple hour long procedure, so I'm going to just kind of give you the real highlights. So we ended up um, using AngioJet. Um, in the LPA, both the four French and then the six French angiojet. We called hematology, um, looked, talked things through with them. Uh, they wanted to do directed TPA infusion, which we did. Um, we gave a total of 1.5 milligrams over 10 minutes um, uh, into the left pulmonary artery and then repeated angiojet after um, the TPA had sat. Uh, we then did some serial balloon angioplasty and got the left pulmonary artery uh, up to about eight millimeters. So um, then there was still clot in the proximal left pulmonary artery, so uh, we just decided to re basically stent the whole proximal left pulmonary artery and put a, a Genesis 2510 on a 10 millimeter balloon, uh, which opened that up. So we've now established some flow. Obviously, the peripheral vessels are still not very good. This time we have been in the cath lab mm, nine hours, something like that. So um, <laughs> we. Uh, just, you guys are just getting going, is that right? No, well, so, <laughs> yeah, so, we, so, you know, this is one of those things, it's like, how, do, how long do you go, what do you do? So what we decided is, um, given the fact that we had already been at this all day, um, uh, that we would let him rest for 24 to 48 hours on ECMO, and then if the patient was doing okay, uh, then we would bring him back to the lab and rotor root some more if we needed to. But we kind of wanted to see clinically what we were going to, what he was going to do, um, post catheterization, and then exactly what his blood he had had blood cultures, but it was only a few hours, so nothing was obviously positive at that time. So um, we decided to let him recover in the ICU on ECMO. He was anticoagulated with heparin. He was getting um, amphotericin B, cefepime, vanc, azithromycin, um, and then two days post cath, he became positive for candida. Um, so um, all cultures were positive for candida, ECMO, everything. So two days post cath, he was uh, his pupils were noted to be fixed and dilated. His head CT had generalized brain edema, some watershed infarct, um, right basal ganglia, minimal subarachnoid hindrance. So uh, care was withdrawn. So. I was going to say that, you know, it's funny because in a congenital room with someone with a pulmonary artery, you know, pulmonary valve stent, we're all thinking about replacing the valve, we're all thinking about putting in a new stent, but if you take that stent away for a second and you look at this case, and this was endocarditis, but mm -hmm. if, you know, if this was, you weren't sure at the beginning mm -hmm. of this case, if you make it into a normal PA and you're talking about a saddle embolus, mm -hmm. you know, I would have, you could make an argument to have done thrombectomy or catheter-directed you know, thrombectomy at an initial stage as the first step before ballooning it. And the reason I say that only, and it's a retroscope, again, I think, you know, I under completely understand where you were going with this, uh, because the data for even angiojet in, in kind of embolic situations in the lungs is, is weak. Uh, and the reason it's weak, and they've seen, I've seen series of 20, 25 patients, we do a lot of CTEP, chronic thromboembolic disease, which is a different case than this with endocarditis, but we see that when you try to suck out acutely clot out of the pulmonary arteries, you get a distal shower almost uh -huh. always. There's just no way to avoid it. So if you have that kind of clot burden, if you balloon it, it yeah. will shower. Yeah. And I don't know if endocarditis <coughs> part changes the rubric, but that would have been a, a potential first step. I, I agree. Uh, you know, again, 
hindsight 2020, when you have a, a large clot like this, in my opinion, the best option is to go to the surgery. Yeah, that was not an option at our institution. No, I understand, but <laughs> I mean, you know. So I just have a, sorry, I just have a follow-up comment on the comment that Dr. Hijazi just made right now, and I'm talking as a current fellow who's going to be an early career person in eight weeks, eight months, so I'm sorry. The surgeon, you're saying should have been surgery, especially if there's suspicion for endocarditis. But what, this, what if the surgeon says no? What, what do you do then as, as, as an interventionist? Are you going to say, I'm out? Do you want to give the patient a chance? I, I don't know. If, if, no, but she, she didn't know that it was endocarditis. It was a suspicion of endocarditis, and that's exactly my point, and, and it's, it's what would do with your observation in there. I think, in retrospect, it's not a perfect science, but an ice catheter can probably give you a good uh, understanding of what was, what was going on in the RBOT, and you probably will pick it up, a, a thrombus in there, and probably your management strategy would have changed. I mean, the carbon's occluded, basically, right? Yeah, it was almost completely occluded. So uh, th the reason why I asked as soon as you showed the first picture if this was a recurrence of endocarditis, we've happened to have a string, uh, so it sort of hands in the air. If this was patient came in with this picture with a melody valve, not a four-year-old with a stent, how many people would have said, oh, it's endocarditis? Right. So we've had a string of about three, three patients that came over a four-month period in the past year with endocarditis presented in an almost identical fashion. Our first maneuver was based on the echo findings where you're seeing almost no flow, RV failure, um, ICU management, inotropic support, some form of antibiotics, especially given the history of endocarditis. And then we had them just go to the OR and resect the whole thing. You're not okay. going to deal the, to try and reduce the mycotic aneurysms and emboli that are going to come. These patients are incredibly sick, incredibly okay. fragile. And I think that trying to do TPA and other things, you might get rid of a clot if it's a clot. The history here to me would be very, very high risk. And I'm not sure what you do when the surgeon says no, other than yeah. consider sending to another center is your only real yeah, option we, to get a surgeon. But no, I don't think they're going to send to another Johns Hopkins to another center, very frankly. I mean, uh... Yeah, we, um, so, so we kind of felt like we were stuck between a rock and a hard place. We, he was so sick, and he was very, very, very marginal. And so we felt like you know, settling him out initially and doing medical management, we didn't feel like he would necessarily survive that. So that's why um, we went and took him to the lab. Even, we had the discussion about endocarditis. This could definitely be endocarditis. He had a history. We knew that. Um, but we also knew that he was in such a state that he wasn't going to survive if we didn't do anything. I, I think that's the right maneuver, to be honest. I think mean, you go and you get instructions and you figure out what's going on afterwards. Uh, I think we're going to So hi, my name is uh, Jenny, and I'm currently in Denver. Um, mine survived. Um, so I, I feel it won't be as exciting, sorry. Let's see. There you go. So this is a five-month-old female, uh, has right atrial isomerism, balanced ABSD, pulmonary atresia, and supracardiac TAPVR. Uh, she had a BT shunt, and then she went for an, a central shunt and takedown of that BT shunt. So she came uh, seven weeks earlier um, for stenting and opening up that um, vertical vein. So we placed a stent, looked good. The picture, on the, the picture on the right, it's how it's open and nice, doesn't seem to be any obstruction, so we're happy with it. Then seven weeks later, she comes for a repeat cardiac cath. She had hypoxemia, secondary to reastenosis, just distal to the vertical vein, right there. Uh, and we ballooned it and didn't respond quite well. 
So we decided that it was time for another stent and shouldn't be that difficult, we did it once, right? So it's time for a stent and we chose a 10 by 19 pre-mounted Genesis transhepatic biliary stent. So the stent looks in place, perfect, exactly what we needed. We do an injection through the sheath and then obviously next step is inflate. Oh yeah, inflate, oh no, inflate. It's really not inflating. We're trying, in the flatteries, up to 20 atmospheres, trying to inflate, nothing's happening. So we're like, okay, so what's going on? Um, we try to, on the first one, try to retrieve the balloon, and with the stent, it's not coming. It's not coming through the teeth for some reason. We haven't really dilated the stent yet, but it wouldn't come through the teeth that came out from. So no idea what's going on. So we actually tested first to see if it was a dysfunction of the balloon. So we placed a PT graphics, it's an 014 uh, wire, through the lumen of the balloon, and it actually stopped like one centimeter before that proximal um, marker of the balloon. So okay, fine, that's occluded, won't work. So then we decided to strip off the balloon, uh, this is strip off the stent, that balloon. So that's the balloon coming out, and we left the stent over this is an 018 SV wire that it was sitting nicely on one of the right pulmonary veins coming down the vertical vein and the right pulmonary vein. So we're like, should be fine, we should go to the next, uh, place another balloon. So there we go. So we place another balloon, nicely, notice it's not center on the stent. So we inflate and there goes the stent. Um, so we said, okay, fine, let's go get it again. So we actually did pretty good. We could go and place several sterling balloons through that stent nicely to try to get it in place. But I think we did the same mistake a couple times. It wouldn't advance farther than there. So then it was never center. We were getting it in place. And because we couldn't advance that balloon further in, we actually inflated it and went down again. So that was like a couple of trials. Let's keep trying. But then the stent was further in, in the right pulmonary vein. Again, as you can see, that balloon wouldn't go further. You can copy paste this 10 times if you want. That was uh, Genesis 10 by 19. Pre-mounted. So then that's the five millimeter sterling. We said, okay, we were using an eight millimeter sterling. It was too big, not going further, so let's go with something smaller. So we went with a five millimeter sterling balloon, and actually we could center it. That was our goal. Put it right in the middle where it should be and try to retrieve, like we just did like one or two atmospheres to just inflate and grab the stent and come back all the way. So we actually could place it where it should be. So there it comes. I'm glad that we remember to, to save this floral. <laughs> um, and then, we inflated, so the whole point of not going with a smaller balloon was like, what do we do once we do that? We're gonna inflate it and then migrate further. But actually, it behaved. Well, that one should be plain. Um, so that one on the right, uh, the balloon inflates, and thank you. And the stand actually stays in place. So then we were extremely careful to get that balloon out of there without moving that scent. And actually we ballooned it then with a 10 and a 12 sterling and we placed it in the right place, thank goodness. And that's the result after. Kid is alive, that's all the excitement I got. Um, there was nothing else, there was just a three millimeter gradient after that and then Neil say what I did such a bad job with that. Um, there was still a gradient but that's the team at Denver saying hi, thank you. If you have another venous line, I mean, you can actually advance a snare through it and trap the wire, pull the snare up, and that will keep the stent there, and you are maybe able to push the balloon back inside the inside. The, I have had a couple of one case where I was able to do that, not in this sim similar anatomy, but in different anatomy. Right. So um, it was a small. Sorry. 
So you put another line in, you put the snare catheter all the way deep, so the wire which is there, you snare the wire, bring it up, and that will hold the stent to push the balloon through it. Yeah, we had just one femoral vein available. The other one was occluded, it was a small baby too. Yeah, no meaning like we didn't have another access available, at least that we went on the same femoral vein or the neck. a small coronary balloon across it, inflate it, and then be able to pull back, like so that it becomes thicker than the actual diameter of the stand. Yeah, I, I'm asking, I, I don't know. I, I think the issue she said is like you got to get a balloon that's actually the right size to actually get it to lock in place. You bring it back, but you don't want to inflate it and get, and then it just embolizes. Now it's now it's bigger and harder to pull back. Even if it's after you cross the whole stand and then you inflate it, then you pull back. So if your balloon is longer, you get the inflation outside the stent on both sides, and you might lock in place for that next reinflation, whether you use the smaller size balloon or not. But if you use something that's three centimeters instead of the two centimeter balloon that you're probably using, you have an opening on each side to keep it into that position, you're more likely to get the expansion. Yep, that's a great point. Do you figure out why it wouldn't inflate the first time? Yeah, so we sent it uh, to check, and it was occluded. The actual... Um, the, the lumen of the balloon was occluded completely. There was, I don't know, it was from the factor, factory, so okay. no idea. Okay, um, thanks very much for allowing me the opportunity to air my dirty laundry in public. Um, it's very interesting that Dr. Benson started off the first talk this morning by saying, start simple, start with a pulmonary valve. I'm, uh, I'm very glad that he's left, so he doesn't have to change his talk now, because this, this is a pulmonary valve that I did. Um, yeah. Um, so essentially, the, the child had an antenatal diagnosis of pulmonary stenosis, which was found to be critical postnatally. The child was managed on prostaglandin infusion. Uh, there was a normal tricuspid valve annular size, obviously suprasystemic right ventricular pressure, and a tripartite right ventricle. It was felt appropriate to proceed with a balloon dilatation of the pulmonary valve, so we did that uh, in the first week or so of life when the child was uh, 3.6 kilos. And um, I was working at Evelina at the time with uh, Professor Qureshi. Uh, he was very keen for us to use the Tyshak mini balloon, so we used a 7 millimeter Tyshak mini balloon in the first instance. Um, and um, although we had a Perhaps we had a slightly subsystemic RV pressure. We accepted that at the end of the case, bearing in mind the child size, acknowledging that it was, it was likely we might come back for a, a, a repeat balloon dilatation at some stage. And so when the child was 10 weeks old, uh, she weighed 4.6 kilos, and uh, she had a suprasystemic uh, uh, RV pressure. Uh, it was MDT, and it was felt reasonable to proceed to further balloon dilatation in the cath lab. And so we did that, um, establishing femoral venous access. Uh, this is the... These are initial angiograms when they eventually get going. And I'll just skip on. This is just using an 018 balloon and an 8 millimeter Cook Advance balloon. Um, this was a situation where myself and some of the colleagues felt we should use a Tyshak balloon because, again, Professor Koreshi was in the, in the cath lab with us, but he suggested that we use this Cook Advance balloon. So this is an 8 millimeter balloon that we've used there. And uh, this is the angiogram following that that shows no dissection in the setting of a still super, super systemic RV pressure. So we felt it was reasonable to proceed with a, with a further balloon dilatation because we had an inadequate result. And so this is a 10 millimeter Cook Advanced balloon, which was inflated under hand pressure. I don't know if, uh, I don't know if you want to just click the, 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 the yeah, that's the one. It was about 7.7, 7.8 um, millimeters, and this is a 10 millimeter balloon. So we initially started relatively conservative, and I think you know we've probably become a bit more conservative with pulmonary valve balloon dilatation. But I think 10 millimeter balloon probably not completely unreasonable. Uh, and, and so there was no no return of uh, no return of cardiac output after the balloon after the balloon went down. 
and I managed to store this fluoro and uh, perform an angiogram at the same time. I still, uh, still wasn't really sure what was happening, and I think sometimes in these situations you can have um, like an orthopedic surgeon type moment. You know the, the YouTube clip where there is a broken bone, I must fix it. So I'm in the cath lab, I must do an angiogram. Thanks very much. <laughs> and then just, just in case anybody's not clear what's happened, it's another angiogram. Yeah, yeah absolutely right. And so we've, we've um, dissected and ruptured the ventricular arterial junction, probably where you were all um, uh, muttering about the, the subpulmonary stenosis below the valve, and I don't have the echo loops to show you that actually most of the stenosis was at the level of pulmonary valve rather than being subpulmonary stenosis. Um, but the, um, it, it, was, uh, it was a very difficult situation. We were able to um, drain the pericardium because the child was in tamponade and auto-transfuse, and with that we had some return of spontaneous circulation. The institutional recipe at the Evelina is that the anaesthetist puts a, puts a cannula in the internal jugular vein, and I've never been more grateful of that. Um, and also, uh, one of the institutional recipes there is that um, we, I had a cannula in the artery, um, and again, I was never more, more grateful of that because we could see we were getting good quality CPR. And we got the surgeon in, and the surgeon opened the chest, put his finger in the hole, and then sewed it up. It, that was a really good question, actually. The, what, the, funny, the funniest part of this whole experience was trying to was seeing Professor Qureshi getting hold of the echo machine, trying to work out how to put patient data into the echo machine <laughs> and do an echo at the same time. Obvi obviously, at the time, I didn't see how funny that was. Um, and, so, <laughs> and so, in terms of reflections, I guess technically simple procedures don't, aren't straightforward. And uh, I thought it was a really important point that Dr. Horlick made at the start of the day, because I think when you're, when you're going from being a fellow to being a, a staff cardiologist or just coming on staff, you sort of, you perhaps don't know what you don't know. You haven't seen so many, uh, so many mistakes. And in fact, before this case started, I said to one of my colleagues, oh, when I'm in charge, I'm not going to put a, a, ca a cannula in the artery for any of these cases. And I've never been more grateful for doing that. Um, and I, I also I had a quite a good relationship with the family, having done the previous procedure, and that's possibly why I haven't had um, any legal papers through the post just yet. Um, and also, it takes, it takes th 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 thanks, thanks very much. <laughs> and, and it's always good to know you can do a pericardiosynthesis in anger, because I've not really had to do that before. And then uh, I saw Nathan gave a very nice, uh, a very nice list of things to go through on your team brief. This is something, some of our quality improvement we're doing with the nursing staff in the cath lab. So we try to teach them in the event of the complication, these are the things that we must have, uh, except M is for monitoring, U is for unfractionated heparin. I'm still working on that one. Uh, and then surgeons in time, which are all really important in dealing with complications. Thanks very much. Um, this case, the pulmonary valve anus was 7.7. .7. I would have started at 1, you know, 1.3, 1.4. 1.3 is a 10 millimeter balloon. That's what caused all this. Is there anybody who would have done something differently? And do you start with one that's 100% the annulus? Or is there anything about that case that you saw the angio that would have made you think this is going to happen? Because I think that I may have, you know, if that was how it happened with just a 10 balloon, I wouldn't have had any of the original pictures of the smaller balloon. I would have started with a 10. I, I mean, I, I know you, you need an answer for this. My, my follow uh, tell me about this balloon that you use. Is it a high-pressure balloon? Is so, it a so, no, it's, um, it's a Cook Advanced balloon. They, uh, for proof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and is you yeah. use hand? So we just use hand, inf hand inflation. So you don't know the, your own strength? No, and... and huh? But sometimes, you know, if you use very high pressure, they say the greater least, sometimes the it diameter may be li larger. I completely agree. I would have started just like he said at with a ten balloon yeah. starting point. Actually, no question. Right. Correct. I started at one twenty. Yeah. I started one twenty actually. Huh? 
How, how accurate is your measurement of the annulus? That will be the next question, right? Right. Can you just play this? The last balloon inflation, sorry. It's not. I, I think, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Part of the difficulty is I'm not really sure what I would have done differently um, in this case, but you just need, just need to, oh, sorry. Yeah. You might just. So see, this is a conundrum from my perspective that everybody says 110%, 100%. I usually use 120% in pulmonic valve cases to start with. So that's why, I mean, you cannot say retrospect about what you do. No, no, retrospect. I agree. So there is enough data published that they say that you don't relieve adequate gradient unless you go even up to 125, 130%. So there is data published on that, so we use the middle, middle term. So I agree with what you're saying, but there is data that you don't need to keep going with higher balloons. We have 30 millimeter balloons now. I don't even want the guy. So start with a pulmonary valve. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know what, uh, Nathan, your last comment. I was just going to say, Sean and I were talking, and we both had similar complications. We had, we had a, a two anders in the RBOC, and you had a ruptor, and they were both moving. They were moving. You just have to do it. Not, not, not as far as I know. Okay, so we're gonna vote. So for the, this is for the, all the money in the world, right? Okay, so all the money in the world. How much would you give for your grandson? Yeah. Uh, okay, so, so no, it's the best, it, no, it's a show, man. it's a show, it's the performance, it's all performance. So Toby showed the pulmonary hypertension with the transeptal into Never Never Land. You guys remember the case? Okay, so let's vote. So voting is the, uh, you mean, which one? Can, can we do live? Yeah. Vote for a competition. So vote for the best, right? The best worst. The best worst complication.